TitleMatchNetwork.com. Wrestling came on Tuesday nights, right? That's when they wrestled at the arena, and they'd show the first couple matches and never show the last couple. So you'd get to school, and everybody want to know, you know, did he win or did he win? Did he, who won? And, uh, in fact, I went to a Catholic school. And even though the kids, there was a few kids that wanted to, wanted to try me out all the time. So I was I had to wrestle my father in the basement of our house or our living room, and, and uh, you know he made it. He made me learn the ropes early. On how, and, and, well, yeah, he, he he learned how you know taught me how to defend myself. And yeah, taught me balance and leverage, and you know how you can really kind of take care of anybody, even no matter no matter what kind of fighters they are. Did your father protect the business for you when you were growing up? He protected it from everybody. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he did. He loved the sport and he believed it. And if you didn't believe it was real, then you shouldn't be in it. At what age did you want to get into the business? Uh, I was playing football at the University of Wyoming. I finished up my senior year. I actually started at Minnesota, transferred out there, played quarterback out there, and had a chance. I signed as a free agent with uh, the Atlanta Falcons and Norm Van Brocklin, who was the coach then. So I finished school right after the season. I didn't finish my classes. I went home, and my dad said, here. You're going to get yourself in shape if you're going to go play football. I said, well, I've been, I'm in good football shape. I just have to throw the ball a lot. He said, but I want you to learn some other techniques that are going to help you out. I want you to train with Billy Robinson. Billy had this real grueling uh, workout that he did, and it was two hours a day. And the last hour was all on the mat. And we'd wrestle on the mat, and it taught me balance again and leverage. But at the end of it, he always did submission wrestling with me. And he'd teach you about three holds in, uh, uh, you know, a week. And uh, get on the mat with him and you know, he would be down there and he'd leave his arm open and you'd think, oh God, yeah, here's what I, here's what I have to do. And you gra by the time you go to grab the arm, he would reverse it and put a submission hold on you and have you screaming your ass off. God, I used to get mad at him. But it really, it hardened me up. I trained from uh, about December till June with him. And then I was getting ready to go to the football camp and decided that I liked wrestling better. And I think this is the direction I want to take. Atlanta had signed Steve, uh, uh, oh, a kid from, uh, oh, geez, Pat Sullivan from uh, Auburn, who'd won the Heisman Trophy that year. So I said, God, I'm not gonna get much of a look and I'm really kind of liking this wrestling. Right. And he says, well, it makes you think you can wrestle. He says, you know, you're pretty small. And I said, well, I, I'm sure you were, you know, what were you when you started, 205, 210? I said, you know, I'm not that. I'm 180, 185, but I'll put weight on. Well, I don't know why you think you can wrestle. I said, well, I've learned a lot from Billy, and I think I can. So uh, he, was, he was sponsoring Ken Patera to go into the Olympics that year as the um, he was, Ken was the first guy to pass 500 pounds over his head. And, he had sponsored him with the 10 going to turn pro when he finished the Olympics. Ken kind of fell on his butt over there and, and uh, didn't do well in the competition. So uh, Rick Flair joined us. Rick was a good friend of mine in college. He always wanted to be a wrestler. I called Rick. I called my good friend Jim Brunzel. We were roommates at Minnesota and football players together. And then Kazra Vasiri, the Iron Sheik, who wrestled on the Iranian Olympic team, he wanted to turn pro. And Kazra was about the same size as me at that time, we were about 180 pounds. And, uh, and then Bob Bruggers, who came out of football, pro football with the Denver Broncos and the San Diego uh, Chargers, played with Wahoo McDaniels and Wahoo recommended him. So we had 200 in our class the first day. And at the end of the day, there were six of us left. Wow. Most of them didn't make it through the first half hour. Wow. It's yeah. a hell of a camp. It's a, that's, that's talent right there. Yeah. How long before you uh, stepped inside squared circle for your first match? How long did you train for? Well, I trained uh, two years, two and a half years. You ever want to quit during the training at all? Was, no. Was, okay. No, I, I, I loved it. I mean, I, I, Billy was a little frustrating working out with him because I didn't feel like I was learning as much as I, I could. But he taught me a lot really for my size and then what my father wanted, he said, when you go in the ring, there's gonna be people that are gonna take a lot of shots at you because of me. So you better know how to defend yourself. And really, I was never afraid to go in the ring with anybody except Mad Dog Vachon. He's the one that, you know, I'd see Vern come home with scratch bites and bites all over him and, 
you know, shit. Right. And the first time I wrestled him, I was in Minneapolis, and I, I, I said to my dad, I said, what do I do with him? He said, hit him twice as hard as he hits you. <laughs> that's it? He says, that's it. So I got in there, and I remember I went to lock up with him, and Mad Dog hit me, and, you know, he had those hands like cement and shit when he hit you. Felt like that cartoon creature, you know. You, you felt like your body was just going to crack all the way down to your feet. Right. And I hit him back, and about the third time, I hit him right over the ear, and he lost his equilibrium. And I grabbed a leg, and I took him down, and I went to take a breath, and he peeled all the skin off my back. I went, oh shit. Huh. And uh, got back about twenty some minutes later into the locker room, and Jim sat next to me, and I'm cut up and got bite marks. And I said, my God, I'm glad. I hope I never have to do that again. About that time, he kicks open the door. And I'd seen this before. I mean, he'd continue it. And I grabbed my chair, and I'm looking at him, and he, he's like, dear, dear, dear. and he goes, I respect you. Shook my hand and walked out. And geez, I almost passed out. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> was it hard following your father's footsteps, given that he was a world champion and a major star? Or was well, that of course it was. Yeah. You know, people always compared you to him. I didn't compare myself to him. I wanted to... Uh, you know, I, I studied a lot from him. I, I learned from him, so I had a lot of his techniques down. And my other, who I and, and a lot I took from Billy Robinson, and I took a lot from Red Bastine. And that's what any good athlete will do. They'll they'll find the people that really kind of gel with their personality and what they want to do, and then you kind of form your own thing. And that's I I never wanted to follow in his footsteps. I wanted to, you know, I was, but I wanted to make my own footsteps. And people always, I remember you'd come out, come out of that tunnel no matter where we were wrestling, oh, there's that skinny guy on you, but people cheered for me. You know, and I didn't know if I was going to be successful at it or not. I, I know from being an athlete, I had that desire that I wanted to be the best I possibly could be. And I wanted to, for not only for myself, but for my father and my family. And uh, I think I can honestly say that, uh, you know, I gave the people their money's worth every time I was in the ring. Was it hard to please your father as you were finding your way in the business? It was hard to please him any time, any time. I had three compliments from him in my lifetime, and that's just the way he was. You know, when you wanted something, you know, he always had the wherewithal that if I wanted a new car, yeah, he'd buy me a car, but no. Right. You work for it. I remember the first time I raked leaves, we had this acre lot, and I raked all by myself, all these leaves up, and I was so proud I got them done. He came home and he said, hey, there's a few leaves out there. I said, well, I'll get them. He says, no, you do the whole yard over again. That way, you always do it right the first time. And, and you earned it. Anything we wanted, my sisters and myself, we had to earn it. My sisters wanted horses, he got them horses. But they had to clean the barn, feed the horses, bathe the horses. You know, they had to shovel the barn out. Did he have a sense of humor, Vern? Oh, yeah, he had a great sense of okay. humor. But I was getting back to the three times that I got compliments from him. First one was in high school. I had a, a great game, completed 13 out of 15, ran for over 100 yards, and we won the game big. And he said, that's the best football game I've ever seen you play. I'm really proud of you. And then twice in wrestling. Jim and I were wrestling Tito Santana and Rick Martell in the Cow Palace. And the Cow Palace crowd was a tough crowd. We walked, the minute we walked out, it was a championship match. We were champions. Walked out, and the people, as Martell and Santana go out, they're yelling, boring. As we come out, boring. I mean, the match hadn't even started. It took 18 minutes, and after 18 minutes, we had them standing. And we, then we, we kept them going for about, and we went about 35 minutes then, total. So, and we had them, and we got back in the locker room, and he took the four of us in, and he said, that, I am so proud of you guys. It's the greatest match I've ever seen. You really controlled it out there, and you controlled it. You took a crowd and just built them into, a, you know, something that, I mean, you know, in a babyface match, they're standing and the place is going right. crazy. I mean, that's, I that's say, tough to like do. Maybe, yeah. And then um, I wrestled with him as a partner against Bachwinkle and Saito in, in St. Paul. And um, we got out of that one, and he said, uh, you are one of the best baby faces we've ever had in the industry. And he said, not because you're my son, just the way you controlled that match out there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was, 
you know. Yeah, that's a huge compliment. That really is. And those are the only three I ever got from him. <laughs> but you had to earn them with him, boy. Right. Yeah. Why is it that uh, you rarely went outside of the AWA beyond the dates that we discussed? Was there any other territories that you wanted to go? I would have liked to. I would have liked to, have, you know, wrestled in Atlanta a little bit. I would have loved to have been in the in the New, in the New York area because of the exposure you got there. Uh, but the kind of money we were making, we couldn't we couldn't make it anywhere else. You couldn't make it in Tennessee. You couldn't make that in Florida. You couldn't yeah. make it in North Carolina. I mean, those guys. It was a grind for those guys. Not that they weren't doing well in North Carolina. They did really well. They they came in. The Crockett's came in when they took over and actually watched our TV and saw how we did it and and took that footprint back with them. They were doing fantastic, and the guys were making really good money, but they were working 366 days of the year and a lot of double shots. We were working 220 to 250 and making as much or more than they were. Yeah. You know? So uh, my father, the big thing was you had to have time for your family. And in the Midwest and, uh, you know, from Winnipeg to St. Louis to the West Coast in May, Everybody was outdoors. They didn't. They didn't want to come into an arena, so we got six weeks off. We got all of May in the first two weeks in June, and then we had you know a few little little shots in some of the smaller towns. And the major cities would run every month, but we wouldn't. We wouldn't draw really big. And I can give you a really good example of that. Hogan wrestled. Uh, we wrestled in April in, in Minneapolis or in St. Paul. And we sold out the Civic, or the, uh, Civic Center at the time, 22,000 people. The building next door, we had another eight in that closed circuit to match. It was him and Bachwinkle and I think Vernon Mad Dog uh, against Ventura and Adonis, I believe is what it was. Right. And um, it was a strong card. Well, Hogan came back and we took May off. He said, book May. He said, I'm red hot. We went from a... I think it was a hundred and eighty thousand dollar gate to a thirty thousand dollar gate, and that was Hogan in the main event. All right, and that was May. Proved to him when we told him, "Hey, we just don't run. You don't do it. We we can't draw." When did you first meet Jim Brunzel, and, and what led to you guys being put together as the High Flyers? Well, we met in college, our freshman year. Jim was from White Bear Lake. I was from Mound. I was a quarterback. He was a running back receiver. So we played our freshman year. We became really good friends, and. Uh, uh, my sophomore year, I was moved to defensive back and kickoff returns, and I wanted to play quarterback. And Jerry Reichow, who was a scout for the Vikings, he told me to go out to Wyoming. He said they, they wanted me. They had recruited me out of high school, and they gave me a full scholarship to come out there. Murray gave me my release, Murray Warmath. Uh, stayed in contact with Jim. Jim played semi-pro football after college, and I called him. I said, hey, Jim, my dad's going to have this big training camp in September. I think you should give it a shot. Jim said, I don't know anything about wrestling. I said, well, you're a good athlete. You'll pick it up. So Jim came and gave it a shot. The rest of the sister. Yeah. We kind of talked about this earlier on. Uh, when the battle royal to fill the vacancy was held for the uh, title that Lawler no-showed and you know never mm -hmm. returned, why didn't the promotion book you to win the belt after so many years of coming close but you never really got it? It was just... Well, I mean, I think you... Going back on it, you have to look at credibility, you know? Vern was big on credibility. Did you personally ever feel that, hey, uh, you know, no. I can carry this title? I mean, did you no. have confidence in yourself? Oh, I knew I could have, but I, I think with the talent we... If Dennis Hilgart really wanted me to have it one night in Milwaukee, uh, Vern was in my corner, uh, and, and Heenan was in the other corner, and the place was sold out, and it, I think the people really felt it coming that night, and we worked something where it got thrown out. Because, and Dennis was trying to convince my dad, just put it on Greg, you know. Well, Nick has, he's got these commitments in Japan in two weeks, we can't do it. And I said, well, we're, we're back in Minneapolis next week, or Chicago, where we were. I said, just drop, drop it back to him. I mean, Dennis was promoting Chicago, that's where it was, and Dennis said, and Greg, you drop it back. See, I don't have any fucking problem with that. No. Yeah. He said it would really it would really help. It would give us a big shot in the arm here in Milwaukee. And Dennis always claimed that after that match, the tennis started going down. 
he said they were ready for it. With Vern in the corner, if you're ever going to do it, that's the time to do it. Right. You know, when something with Vern screws it up and I win the title, and next week we're in Chicago. Well, he was afraid it would get to Bubba, and Bubba would then cancel the trip for Nick, and Nick was making some pretty good sh- gotcha. shing over there. How did you end up in the uh, role in the first Highlander film? Uh, they wanted to shoot uh, some wrestling footage, and they came to, we had the match at the Meadowlands, and they came to Vern. They said, we want to have, we need a real exciting, something where there's a lot of movement. And he said, well, the best match you're going to probably get is that six-man tag team match with the Freebirds and these three guys. I didn't even ask you about Michael Hayes, Terry Gordy, and Buddy Roberts. What are your memories of those guys? Well, we didn't get to work with them that much. My around. memories of them? Right. Shit. No shows? You know, three were supposed to show up, two would show up. Two would show up, or one would show up, and the other two wouldn't. You know, they had they had some problems at that time, you know, outside of the ring. It was too bad because they were really a talented group. Is there anything you miss about the business today? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to be a part of it. But I think it's passed me by. I mean, it really, I, I couldn't. Uh, if if guys have to be trained the way they're trained now, and there's there's no story to the match, that's hard for me to you know fathom. Right. And taking somebody and saying you're going to be a pirate, you're going to be a a clown. Um, you know, we learned be yourself, because everybody has something inside who they want to be or who, how they want to project themselves, and until you let that come out. You're never successful. Is there anything in closing you want to say to your fans out there that you might not have had a chance? No, I tell you what. Uh, I just hope that uh, anybody out there that ever watched me wrestle, the one thing that I always, my partner and I always, our, our goal was to make sure our fans got their money's worth. And I hope they did. And I love the support they gave us over the years. And uh, anytime they need anything from me, uh, give me a call or stop me and we'll talk about wrestling.